yeah exactly nice. yeah. so we're recording this session if, if anybody's got a problem with that please please let us know um but we had a lot of people that are on vacation or on other calls so it's really quite important that we told you that we were recording the session if you have a, an issue with that but you can play it back afterwards which is even more enlightening um, so good morning everybody welcome to um, our um, session in conversation with series with the rise organization organization for women in broadcast um, particularly welcome to some of our 2020 cohort of mentees this year um, during the pandemic, it, it's been a really tough um, change for all of us and having the mentorship program in place, um, it, we thought it was very important to go ahead with the mentorship program. We've got a large number of ladies on the program that are benefiting from it, but in quite an interestingly different way to previous years. So I want to welcome them and I want to encourage you all to ask questions as well uh, during the um, and then what we'll probably do is submit questions as we go along and then open up at the end and um, you can ask Mandy Hickson, who's our special guest today, any questions that you may have. So let me introduce Mandy for those of you who don't know her. Uh, Mandy is originally from Cheshire. She gained a joint honours degree in sports science and geography from Birmingham University and she has around about 25 years of experience in aviation. Um, she joined the RAF in 1994 I believe and has been one of the very uh, few female pilots to actually operationally fly a Tornado GR4 and also, you know, over the uh, patrolling over the um, no-fly zone of, of, of Iraq as well. So quite an achievement. Um, since leaving the RAF, she's actually um, retrained in um, human performance factors, I believe. That just tripped off your tongue, Nikki. Well done. I, know, I, I looked at that and I thought, she's going to tell us a little bit more about that. <laughs> And her company, obviously, Experience from the Frontline, where she draws upon uh, experiences that she's gained in, in leadership, in decision making, and most importantly, you know, taking calculated risks as well. So last year, she climbed Kilimanjaro, I believe, <laughs> which was, a, I'm sure, a wonderful experience. Great, because it was a fundraising expedition as well. And um, this year, she's published her first book. And for those of you that were on the call earlier on, you will have heard about this. Yeah, wonderful. An officer, not a gentleman. Um, a great read, a fascinating read. You know, for me, I didn't know much about aviation, so it was a really educational read for me. But a lot of laughs and a lot of tears, um, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So Mainly thank you for me, mainly from me, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I also want to mention you're a mum too. To oh, yes. Yes. Those are delightful moments. <laughs> so if she goes like this during the presentation, you know that they will. <laughs> my two random children have wandered into the room. I just get this hand going back off. <laughs> So welcome on board. I bet nobody said that to you before, have they, Mandy? No, indeed, indeed. Strap in, <laughs> sit back, relax, get your gin and tonics out and ready for the flight. <laughs> so can we come into your office? Can yeah, you... absolutely. In fact, you know what, Nikki? It would be a really lovely way to start it. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an experience of, of what it's like to be in my world. Ladies and gents, step into the office. Roger, and you are clear to display the wind at the moment, 29011, crosswind 7 from the right.
that's basically wow. <laughs> that's where you take a 17 year career and you just compress it into a one minute pop video that's just the way forward in life is it not <laughs> Well, I think your life's been a little different than mine, so <laughs> oh, one I'm of those sure videos. Not. I'm sure not. <laughs> but yeah, it, may, it makes me go wow every time I watch it. Um, you know, I, like you said, reading the book, there's a lot of wow moments as well. So can you talk a little bit um, to, you know, the audience about some of those elements uh, that you've um, built up during your career? you know, the leadership, the teamwork, the grit. I love the grit. Yeah, absolutely. So what I would say, guys, who are for all the people participating as well, if you have a question that comes to mind, can you pop it in the chat room as well so that we've got some really nice questions? Because I'm sure it's one of those cases, isn't it, where if we wait to the end, you go, oh, I had a question and I can't remember. Well, if you're anything like me, it is anyway. You can't remember what it was. So, you know, pop your questions in the chat room, pop your feedback as we're talking. It's lovely to get that sort of interaction with you as well. Um, so, yeah, just shall I just give you a quick canter through the sort of the, the career bit and how I got to do what I did then, Nikki? Yeah, tell yeah. us about your journey. So basically, I, um, I, I first wanted to join the Air Force. Well, I, I got into flying when I was about 13 because I joined the Air Training Corps. And the Air Training Corps is a fantastic organisation for any youngster that's got any sort of interest in it. Um, I joined the Air Training Corps on the very first night it opened its doors to girls. And I didn't join necessarily because I wanted to fly at that point. I joined because my mum pointed out I went to an all-girls school and that might be my only opportunity in life to meet some boys. So well done to my mum for this fantastic sales pitch. I joined the Air Force, I joined the RAF uh, Air Training Corps, but I flew. I flew for the first time in something called a Chipmunk and it's a really old aircraft. It's, in a, it's actually in a museum now. And I loved it, literally. I felt as if I got this sense of coming home. And I sort of describe it as dancing in the air. And that was exactly my experience from RAF Woodvale up near uh, Liverpool. I loved it, wanted to do it, but women weren't allowed to be pilots in the air force. And so there was not anything I could do anything about. So I continued to pursue the dreams. And at 17, I got a flying scholarship. From there, I used my paper round money to pay for the additional 10 hours and I got my private pilot's license from Blackpool Airport. Perfect because it's got this huge tower. So if you're flying and you get lost, it's a banker for getting your way back. Um, and then I basically went off to university in Birmingham and I was in my second year at uni when they changed the rules allowing women to join. And so I applied to join and I failed all the tests to be a pilot and I was pretty devastated. Um, you're allowed to do these tests twice in your life. So I waited a year, Nick, and I went back a second year. And this time, for my final last time of trying, I actually failed them all again. And at this point, I'm pretty devastated. Um, the door has shut now. There is no way forward. But this is where you often need a mentor. And this is why I feel that programs like this are so important to have around because we need people to believe in us. And sometimes it's it's not somebody in your family, it's not somebody of your closest friends, but it's a, someone that believes in you and they see that you've got something and they believe that you can make it. And so basically it was a, a boss of a squadron at the University Air Squadron. And he just couldn't understand why I'd failed when I proved myself to be a really capable pilot. And so he put his neck on the line. He got an Air Vice Marshal, a guy called Dave Cousins involved, and they used it as their case study to say, well, why is it that women aren't passing the tests? Um, I joined as an air traffic controller, which was a big leap of faith. That's like jumping off a cliff, hoping your parachute will open. But I really believed I'd make it, even though, you know, I, there was no way forward. I, I went through officer training as an air traffic controller. And I just kept writing all these letters to anybody that would hear my case. And eventually I just wore them down and all the, all the stars aligned. And I got a letter back saying that they were going to give me the opportunity uh, to basically try and see how far I'd get throughout, throughout the flying training for someone that had not passed the test. And I was taken on as a test case, basically. They couldn't understand why 70% of women at this stage were, were failing the tests compared to about 70% of men that were passing them. And that's a huge discrepancy. And actually, it's a very odd one, isn't it, that men and women process things differently. And actually, that's why when we talk about, you know, gender diversity, cultural diversity, that's why it's so important because we all bring something different to the equation. Uh, and so I got the opportunity to join. So there you go, there's a quick potted history as to how I actually ended up getting in. So did they change something? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, they did. They actually went the process. Off. They they looked into it and they realised that the tests they'd had had been around for many years. They'd been designed for men by men for men to do the job, which was correct because it was only men that were doing the job at the time. But actually, they also realised that the tests were fairly antiquated, uh, um, antiquated, because they were testing basically stick and rudder skills, which is sort of the manual flying. And actually, as the aircraft were becoming more and more advanced, they needed to advance their tests, basically. That was the key to it, not just the woman angle, but also the fact that, you know, the, the, the aircraft on the front line were so much more technologically advanced than how they were previously. They needed people with better situational awareness, better decision-making capability, and all of those human elements that became really, really important as well. Yeah. They did, by the way, ask me to do the tests. Once I was on the front line, they got me back to do the new tests, and that was the most stressful day of my life, more so than flying in a war zone, because I just kept on thinking, if I fail these tests now, it just means I'm wrong. Wrong kind. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the other thing that made me laugh was, you know, during that training, you obviously, you, you had a lot of teamwork and support and help from the people that were with you to get you through those tests. I love the story that you tell in the book of the, the bicycles on the playground. Mm. A little bit about... It wasn't a playground, Mrs. Come on, <laughs> this is a parade ground, you know. Okay. Oh, yeah, parade ground. Yeah, it's, 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 it was just one of the most incredible moments, really. And it, it, the reason, and I actually normally share it in my speech, so I do a lot of keynote speaking, and it's the one story that people remind me of nine years down the line. People say, I'll never forget the story of the parade square. And the reason is, is because, so I was, um, I got through the whole of flying training pretty much unscathed. I failed the odd flight. You know the odd challenge but everyone did it's basically when you get to advanced flying training on the hall it's like doing a an advanced driving test twice a day for 10 months it's stressful i was three trips away from graduating from gaining my RAF wings and i failed a flight but not a problem i took it the next day i failed it again and suddenly you know the stress bucket is filling up i'm not sleeping i've got unusual skin rashes all over my body which i put down to a change of washing powder but of course it was stress taking actually a physical symptoms you know and um the next day i was basically going to be like going up my chop ride and the, the flight i've been failing just to give you some perspective it's basically the culmination of all of your training you're going and you're learning something called battle turns so two airplanes heading off in we call it in the weeds where we head we fly really low so normally you're flying around about 250 feet and in some areas of the country, by the way, we can drop down to 100 feet, but they're very, very small areas where there's not much um, civilization, basically. But 250 feet, traveling at about 480 knots. Um, so that's about, Cyril would be able to pick me up, but that's about 520 to 540 miles an hour, something like that. And you're basically out flying with a wingman. Why? Because when you're flying as a solo, as a single person, you've got a blind spot and it's directly behind your aircraft. You can't physically see into the space. So if you're going out to do navigation, you're trying to hit targets within a timing of five seconds. You have no GPS at the time, no moving map, you know, just a stopwatch and a compass. And you have an enemy that's airborne. I mean, they're also called our instructor, by the way. They try to get behind you into the six o'clock position, simulation to you down with a missile. Now you've got to evade that threat and hit the targets on time. But if you're a singleton, you won't spot the enemy. So give yourself a wingman and suddenly you've got the mutual support, that 360 vision that we all need in business as well. But it means you must coordinate your turns. You can't just turn to the left. You're two individuals. And so as you're coming up to turns, you've both got to pull up. You've got to cross at a perpendicular angle and you, then you roll out and you're in perfect formation, battle formation. That's what I was failing. I was always in the wrong place. I just couldn't seem to get my mental model around it. And I used to practice this maneuver, and practice the whole trip every single night in my bedroom, surrounded by a cardboard cockpit. I'd flick switches, make radio calls, answer my own radio calls. I mean, I pretty much looked like I was on the edge of a breakdown, if I'm honest. <laughs> and there's a knock on my door. It's one of my great friends on the course, a guy called Rob, or the puppy. He was the youngest on the course. And he said, Mandy, we have decided we're taking you out this evening. I said, I'm going nowhere with you all. I've got a chop right tomorrow. He said, you're going to have to trust me. And when he said that, I was at a really low ebb. And I thought, what did I have to lose? 
And it was at that point he took me down to the bike sheds and I thought, yeah, the trust is waning at this point, you know. But we got onto our bikes, we cycled to the other side of the airfield and basically it got this big parade square. And there, waiting and lurking in the shadows were the remaining members of my course. And they'd all been really busy making their bikes look like aeroplanes, sticking wings onto them and everything. Oh, wow. Basically, we would spend the next three hours just cycling up and down this square basically going 30 left, 60 right, manoeuvre, rotate. And we did all the manoeuvres. I couldn't get my head around in the air on the ground. And the penny dropped. I thought, this is so easy. And I'd been stuck in that rut, you know, that we all have at times when we're working on something and we get that tunnel vision completely fixated on the task in hand. And we get this tendency, we keep on doing it in the same way. And then we're really shocked when our results are exactly the same. And that's why we need the different perspective. That's why we need input from our friends, from our colleagues, from our team. I flew the trip the next day, I passed. I didn't know I'd passed, but at the end, I brought the aircraft to the standstill. I opened my canopy, my instructor got out and he descended the steps. Out the corner of my eye, I saw him kneeling down and kissing the floor. And I thought, yeah, that's not boding well. He's just running to have not killed him and he's about to say, you're chopped. And he said, Mandy, what the hell was that? You know, I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, do you know what? I really like you, but you've gone from bad to worse this week. And he said, and by the way, yesterday you were absolutely rubbish or words to that effect. And he said, what has happened overnight? And when I told him the story, he just went, wow. And I said, it was so lovely, so sweet of them. And he said, it's a little bit more than that. And the big thing is when you're going through fast jet training, you are working as a team, but you are also in competition because there are certain spaces on the front line. And we were in a system where we were holding a lot. So we were waiting for sort of a year or so for the next course. But there just so happened to be spaces on courses starting almost immediately. And there were six spaces on those courses. And I was number seven. And the guys knew that fact. And they still went the extra mile to get me through where really, if I got through, I would be jeopardizing one of their own career advancement by potentially up to a year because they would be pinged into the holding system. So that is emotional. I mean, that makes you realize what that teamwork is all about. And, and it's that brothers in arms feeling. And I say brothers in arms because they were all men. You know, I was the only woman on any course I've ever been on. And so that was really powerful. And, you know, that trust that you build up is second to none. Um, you know, it's just incredible, really. Yeah, Carrie was just saying that it's great to hear. You know that that teamwork, that level of support. Um, that, you know, it's so critical to have that um, in in your career. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I see that Jenny's asked a question there. You know, are there any differences and challenges between being a woman in the RAF compared to being a man? And I think it's a really good question. No, physically there are none. I mean, genuinely, there's no reason that a woman cannot do the job as any differently to the man you know physically most of the aircraft are all fly by wire mentally you know we multitask well we are pretty you know uh, incredible human beings aren't we there's no difference between men and women being able to do the job i absolutely don't believe um but that brings you quite nicely onto the, the psychology the difference between women and men yeah, I, I think it's been really interesting, actually. So we, I was trying to find out how many females have actually flown uh, on the front line. And I mean, only, there was only five women that flew on the front line in, in, on the tornado. So that's ridiculously small amount, isn't it? Um, and I, when I was sort of asking a few questions, I found out that it's basically about 7% of pilots in the RAF currently are women. And I think only about 1% of the front line on fast jets are women, though. So it's, it's just ridiculous. So why is that happening? And that's the crux of it. Why are women still not doing it? And the answer is, I genuinely don't know. I mean, there is obviously the going to war aspect that might not appeal to some women, but that might not appeal to some men. Why should that be a gender thing? Um, and that's, that's something that, you know, people you know, just need to talk about. But I still find it fascinating. There was a really interesting programme that um, a charity called Inspiring the Future put out. And I don't know if many of you saw it. It was basically about three women that went into a school, fighter pilot, um, firewoman and a surgeon. And they basically walked into this school of young pupils and they talked a little bit to them, put them at ease. They're all in their civilian clothing, you know, dressed as we are now. 
and they basically said, draw me a picture of a surgeon, a fast jet pilot and a firefighter. And about 98% of the kids all drew men, even though the women were running the session and they were sort of asking them and they all named them Bob the firefighter, Steve the fast jet pilot. And the girl, the women then went out, got changed into their outfits, came back in and the children went, why are you dressed up like that? And they went, no, we are them. And they still went, that's ridiculous. And the, the, the uh, fast jet pilot, one little girl said to her on the way out, having then had an education about it, wore the flying helmet, done all this, the little girl, one little girl said to her, Nikki on the way out, she said, uh, do you have to give your husband back his outfit when you get home? I, I think, you know what, it sort of sums up the gender stereotyping and how six-year-olds still believe these are men, male jobs. Yeah. So, so much to be done still to get girls... At the grassroots level. Yeah. A completely grassroots level. Um, yeah. you know, Which is what we're doing with the Rise Up programme, as you know, yeah, encouraging girls in schools yeah. in you know, early broadcast careers. Um, but it's exactly the same, Mandy, in, you know, in the broadcast industry with... Um, top um, CTOs, um, CEOs, presidents, all, all being, you know, men. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, we do need to encourage more women into those spots. I know, and it's that role modelling of behaviour. If you don't ever see anybody get into the top, then you almost make the assumption that you can't have that job available to you. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts, Nikki, then, on quotas versus targets? So it, it's a very difficult one, you know, because you don't want positive discrimination. You want people that can, can do the job. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you've got to look at that pool of people that can do the job. And out of that, that pool of people, you know, we've got to get the right people to do the job. Yeah. I, I loved your stories as well about, you know, the psychology between men and women as well. And you, when you um, uh, went to the Dominican Republic, I'm sure the... the oh. The people on the on the call are going to love this one. So. Well, this was priceless. I mean, it's happened <laughs> many, many times. So in between two of our courses, basically, our course was suddenly told, the course in front haven't finished, there's been bad weather, you've got two weeks. So some of the audience will get this, some of you will not. We went on to CFAX. That's how old I am, yeah. CFAX, and we decide to book our holiday to the Dominican Republic. All the whole course decide, we're on CFAX, we picked up a really cheap deal. I mean, how does that even work, CFAX? Anyway, well, I should be asking the broadcasters here. Anyway, so we book this holiday, we go off to the Dominican Republic, the whole of the course. And I mean, I was with my husband by now, not as a husband, but he was my boyfriend. And so it wasn't that there was any intent in this, but we all went out in the Dominican and we're in this big resort. All the guys are doing lots of little flirting, going up to women. Oh, I'm a fast jet pilot. The women are going, oh, hallelujah, they've got a fast jet pilot. I went up to some man and I said, I'm a fast jet pilot. I have never seen men run so quickly in the opposite direction, but not just one, two, three. In the end, I just went, I'm a nurse. And they went, happy days. And suddenly hierarchical gradient was established and hey, presto, suddenly they were interested. I couldn't believe it, but I've seen it. It's not just then as well. I mean, I go on a girl's trip. We used to go skiing and we'd often be in somewhere like Morsey and we're at a bar and I'd love it. There's basically four very, very, you know, qualified ladies sitting around a table. One's head of HR for the co-op. One was a you know, medical director of a hospice, one was ran the whole of PR for Magnus, and we're sitting around this table and there's myself and they always use me, they go, our friend's a fast jet pilot. And the, all the guys go, yeah, yeah. And I'm, and I'm an astronaut. I'm an astronaut. <laughs> and, you know, and actually, I, I say, no, actually I work on the tills in Tesco's and they go, you know, oh, I'm much happier with that. Now we can all get on. It's just, it's just so funny, the psychology of it, isn't it? I'm just, I'm just so relieved in some ways that I've got this magnificent husband that was in the aviation world as well. And so yes. I met him almost on day one of, of, of joining the Air Force. And um, it was brilliant, really, because it meant that I never was, you know, having to try to talk anyone through that psychology of what that feels like. Um, it was brilliant, you know. Yeah. And he's the best wingman you could have. <laughs> Good on Craig. <laughs> Right. Um, let's uh, let's talk about um, something that comes up all the time in um, the mentorship program, which is the um, 
don't know whether I'm good enough. The imposter syndrome. Am I really good enough to do this job? Am I going to be, you know, the next CEO? Yeah. Can I take this job? Have I got the qualifications? Yeah, it's a really interesting one because I come across as a really confident person. Um, I know there's a colleague of mine, Dan, or a really good friend of mine, Dan, much more in the audience. He'll say, yeah, she's a very confident person. And I am. But do you know what? I have suffered imposter syndrome as much as the next person. And I think it doesn't, it's not necessarily linked to confidence. I don't think so. I think it's all, it's like you've got two people on your shoulder, isn't it? It's like the devil and the angel. And, you know, when something happens, you know, you think, oh, I mean, and the whole of training, because I'd, A, because I'd failed all the tests, and I'd been told I was being taken on as a test case, it was almost a told, how far will you get before you fail? And so actually the knock-on effect of that was every time I struggled, I think, this is the moment I'm going to fail. Oh, I'm not good enough. You know, and all of those little things, and they start to build up. And I don't know if men feel it as much. I, I genuinely don't think they do. I think, you know, <laughs> there might be slight doubts in there, but I don't think they normally feel that whole am I good enough feeling to it? You know, they feel, well, I've got the job and therefore I should be able to do it. And again, going back to school children, an interesting one, there's been so many studies done on this, but one of the overriding things is that young girls will basically, if you ask them, they'll say that they're no good at it until they prove they are. Young boys say they're good at it from the outset, even though they've never tried it. Because it's just, and again, it's, who knows? It's just a gender thing. I don't know. But no, I've, I have always su suffered a little bit from the imposter syndrome. And especially since leaving the Air Force, actually, um, I always wait to be found out. I, I literally have spent my whole life, I, I get offered these jobs. And so one of them was to speak at this, <laughs> this conference for the United Nations in Vienna. And basically, I was vetted. I had to do all these like online courses on what happens if I come across a car bomb? And I was like, really? I'm only going to speak at the headquarters in Vienna. What on earth are they wanting that for? Anyway, you have to do all these things. And I walk into this room and it's to speak to the International Atomic Energy Agency, all about just culture, which ties into my human factors training. And even my husband said to me, why have they asked you? Like, really, you're not exactly an expert in this field, are you? I was like, I said yes, and I'm just going to run with it, you know. Um, but I walked into this room, and I'm thinking, yeah, a bit enough more than I can chew here. I really don't know what I'm talking about. And the whole time I was thinking, I don't know what I'm talking about. And then I sat there, and there basically were six speakers before me, all experts in their field of nuclear power, some of them talking about human factors. I was listening to them, I thought, A, you're boring, and I can't even basically hear your messages because I'm almost falling asleep listening to you and see I actually do know everything that you're saying and it, it's only when you're hearing others and you think maybe I am good enough and it's like women have said it all the time they go into meetings and they oh you know be keep quiet and then they're listening to the conversation thinking I've actually got a better idea than that and it's about growing in confidence to say yes I have got a voice it is really important that I use it and I am good enough and you almost have to keep on saying, I mean, I say yes to everything. And then I absolutely, I'd say brick myself behind closed doors thinking, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have done that. But you know what? Every time you do it and prove you can, that's knocking another little chip off the in imposter syndrome. And it's really important that we do believe in ourselves because it's yeah. amazing what we can do. Yeah, and this is what we tell uh, the ladies on the mentorship programme all the time. You know, yeah. take it on, do it, just believe you can. I, I, you know, I love your, your dream it, believe it. So we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, someone yeah. came up with that, actually. It's a fantastic motto. And, and, you know, especially when you go to schools, dream it, believe it, and do it. And they, the kids will quote it back to me and they'll put the hashtags on. Dream it, believe it, because, you know, it's all about the hashtags. I'm finally getting up on Instagram. I've just finally worked out how to use it. It's all about the hashtags, I was told. So um, but it's been fascinating, that sort of journey. But yeah, that, it, it is. Have, believe that you can do it. You yeah. Know? And the, the other question I had for you was, was around resilience, really. You know, that's the other thing that comes up on the mentorship program yeah. all the time. You know, how resilient are you? And yeah. We're all having to be pretty resilient at the moment because these are unprecedented times. They are, aren't they? Yeah, it's quite weird, isn't it? It is. And it, you know what? Resilience is not a gift. If you could give it, so I, I would have two gifts. If I could give a gift to my children, one would be 
resilience and the other would be confidence and I think if you've got those two that you don't once you get those knockbacks you can bounce back and you have the confidence to apply yourself constantly if I could give those two gifts and I would do they're the two gifts you can't give you've got to build that up especially resilience and I think resilience starts at a really young age again and I think that's why competitive sport and being part of a team is so important for resilience you look at the people that are more resilient generally they are people that have done sport because do you know what from an early age at the age of six and five and six you're on a rugby pitch I'm saying that for Dan but you're on a you're on a, a court you're playing a, a game and you're not winning and guess what that's that is life it's a pretty tough lesson but even at six you're gonna burst into tears and then you will at seven and then you will at eight when you don't win the competition and then start to eventually you realize you've got to come up with some tactics some you know plans of how do I cope with it and I saw my son do this brilliantly what he used to do was he knew they were about to lose a match so he would get injured so that he could officially burst into tears on the pitch and then could be crying and then when we did lose the match he would then be fine because he's got rid of the emotion but the emotion was always becoming too overwhelming i have to say that was when he was quite little by the way but it's coming up with strategies isn't it and if yeah. we've done that from an early stage then we build them up but you know what resilience the ability to bounce back you know not being stretched so far that we then can't rebound and actually how do we do it and that is only through tried and testing it's through failing it's through picking ourselves up and it's through learning and some of those lessons are really tough but basically that it amazes me why they, why they took competitive sports away from schools you know, I know. I, 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 absolutely flabbergasted. it seems crazy doesn't it when you think about it guys i'd love to get some of your questions as, as we're talking <laughs> as you think about questions please pop them in the uh, the chat room a because that means i know you're listening because we can't see your beautiful faces but also it just gives us you know something to be thinking about as well as we uh, finish so yeah no i think resilience is a really important one i mean for yourself nikki you know how resilient a person would you say you are and have you have you built up that resilience through time yeah and and through knockbacks i think yeah. you know you do need those in life um i you know i was told many years ago that i would never be a manager in test and measurement sales i would never make it um yeah. i remember the the tears that flowed on the drive you know 70 80 miles till i got home yeah. broke apart when i got home and i remember my husband saying well you you'll either you'll do it or you you'll give it up and do something else what are you going to do these are your choices yeah, and actually sometimes bouncing it off someone, and I do that with my husband, you know, when I'm feeling particularly low about something. Like, I mean, to be honest, a really good example, I mean, you say we've needed resilience in the lockdown period. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I went from um, business that was booming. I was sort of almost fully booked as a, as a keynote speaker all over the world, absolutely loving it, finally come to fruition, everything I'd worked for. And yeah, and I was uh, doing two, three, maybe four a week, you know, literally, it was wonderful. Teenage boys never having to be in the house, perfect. Um, so I think it's sort of like an ideal situation there. And then COVID hit, every event cancelled, every booking cancelled. And it's almost like you sit there and you go, I've lost all my work, I've lost all my booking, I'm not getting paid, I'm not in any furlough scheme, I don't hit any government grants at all. I'm sitting there thinking, I've lost everything. But you can sit there and weep about it, or you can say, right, well, best I get off my arse, finish the book, get, use that creative time to finish the book that I've been trying to do for three years. Um, but I'll tell you what else is really important, I think, that ties in with resilience, is purpose. And I think a lot of people, as in the COVID situation, the lockdown hit, we lost our purpose, that reason of getting up in the morning. Um, and actually, I applied to the local hospital and my husband and I ended up volunteering and the only place they needed help was the laundry. So basically since the start of lockdown, we've been volunteering. Just what you want to do, laundry. <laughs> yeah, I was like, hold on a minute. I've got four men or three men in my house. All I seem to do, or all we seem to do, I'll be honest, my husband's all over it too. But here <laughs> I am now, so that's what I did. Three months we've been folding scrubs, folding scrubs in the laundry. And then I got qualified to use the washing machine. 
So I was all over that. I was like, hello, hello. You know, I was masking up, apron up, gloves on because they're the COVID ones as well. So, you know, getting it all loaded up, but I was quite thrilled with that. So it gave me purpose, but it gave me purpose. It gave me reason and it gave me yet another level of resilience. What am I doing this week? Well, there's my structure. There's your routine. So um, that's fantastic. Um, I'm just going to read some of these questions as they're coming up, Nikki. Are you happy with that? Yeah, there's quite a few. Yeah. Um, some from Claire. Some women obviously take career breaks to bring up families, etc. Then they're confident uh, about coming back to their careers after a few years. Do I have any tips, Claire? Do you know what? That's an absolutely brilliant question. And in fact, when I left the Air Force, um, so when I was in the Air Force, a really big learning point for me was um, I got pregnant finally at the end of um, a tornado tour, and um, I basically went into a ground tour because you can't be pregnant while you're flying. It's not too good for basically being hit in the stomach by a G suit constantly. And I was on a ground tour and I had a very productive ground tour in the form of two children in very quick succession. So that was a, a winner. And at the end of that, my basically I contacted my um, posting officer, the person above me, and I said, you know, what jobs are available to me. And I was really quite career driven at this stage. You know, I wanted to make it, I wanted to be promoted. And they said, he said to me, and he very rightly said to me, unless you go back to the front line or you take a, a flying instructor's job, you will never be promoted. You have got to take one of those roles. I said, I have got a four month old and a 20 month old babies at home, basically. I can't, I can't do that. My husband was an airline pilot and he was based out of Gatwick. And my, the job they were offering me actually was up at RAF Valley in Anglesey. And I thought, I'm gonna split my family. I'm gonna have to go up with two children and a flying instructor's job is not nine to five. You do night flying, you do early trips, late trips. I'm thinking, this is not going to work. I just couldn't see a way forward. So going back to your point there, Claire, I had to choose a job, which was called a second line job. And I was told, if you take it, you'll never be promoted. And I wasn't. So I basically kept a job, but lost my career is a good way of putting it. I and mean, I did still fly, by the way, and I actually ended up in a fantastic job. And I loved that job. But it was nine to five, Monday to Friday, and was not the way I'd seen my career progressing. When I then left the Air Force, I was aware that so many women felt exactly as I had done. And so I know that I really had lost my confidence. And I think that whole term of confidence is like a muscle, and we need to exercise it. Once we've been out of the workplace for a bit, quite a period of time, going back into it makes you feel really underconfident, you think. Not only do I feel I can't do my job, but my head is now absolutely full on the juggling that we all have at that point. And so I actually set up a business called Inspiring Women for Work. And it was all about creating a mentorship program for women to return to the workplace. Um, and, and I was absolutely passionate about it. And then I just couldn't, I couldn't seem to get anyone on the course. And I had to abandon the actual business model um, because basically I realized that when you're in that stage, you're almost not confident enough to say, I need help. Mm. <laughs> and so that was a really interesting learning point, but I was so passionate about it. I was like flogging a dead horse, desperately trying to market it. And yet my speaking career was going through the roof. I was ignoring that because I was passionate about my inspiring women. Um, so do I have any tips? All I would say is surround yourself by a fantastic network. The network is phenomenal. Um, and that really worked for me. You know, if you get caught out, it actually, I had, I used a nanny and she was the a godsend to us. And, you know, having a nanny in those early stages was almost essential for me. Um, I just couldn't seem to work it. I mean, I was having to commute two hours up to High Wycombe from Winchester initially. So I couldn't be leaving the house at 6.30 in the morning, getting home at 6.30 in the evening and then take my children to nursery. It wouldn't have worked. But, um, you know, having a nanny and then when they start school, having a fantastic network, you know, but you help them out. And I love that with Motherland, you know, if anyone's seen Motherland on BBC iPlayer, you know, that sort of sums it up that whole, can anyone just have my children for a few hours, you know? And I felt like that so often. I'd be going, oh, I've been asked to go up to um, Blackpool for a meeting. Can anyone just have my children for three hours? I'm going to, you know, and you, you call the favours in, but you also repay them in kind. So yeah, I would just say network, the confidence, believe that you can. And, you know, it's, it's about only about getting back onto the horse, you know, that whole, the horse is bolted, get back onto it, get back into the workplace. And you know what, you won't just be able to do the job as well as you did before. You'll be able to do it better because your time management will be unbelievable. 
because it has to be. Yeah. And you've learned. I completely it. agree with that, Claire. You know, my, I, I did exactly the same. My, um, I went back to work six months after I'd had my first and um, my husband actually gave up work to look after my boys. So we had a different setup, but he started his own business and we needed the network of the family. Um, it was amazing, actually, at the school gates. He used to get so much help from everybody to, to look after the boys. I actually remember that going to collect them from a flight once in Scotland, an EasyJet flight, and um, I'd gone up there to work and he came up with them um, for a wedding with my youngest, who was six months old on the plane. And as he came out of arrivals, he'd actually got the captain plus the crew all helping with his luggage <laughs> the pram. And I, I said, you know, nobody had done, done that for me. It was amazing. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And they'd all been hailing him a hero. <laughs> yeah, they had. Yeah. I feel sorry for that, that husband. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, there's a lovely question from Anna there. Um, Anna, what is leadership and can anyone become a leader? Um, yeah, there's that lovely one, isn't there? Is leadership, leaders made or born? I think it's a, an amalgamation of the two, by the way. I do think people are more natural leaders from the start of their lives and they demonstrate those skills. But I do believe that you can learn leadership as well and you can hone those skills. And some of the best leaders I've seen personally are the ones that step back. They surround themselves by people that are better than them because actually, you know, that's the incomplete leader, isn't it? It's the, it's the vulnerability. It's the saying, actually, I want to have people that are better than me because then they can feed into me and all you're going to do as a leader is channel them. In fact, somebody said to me once, be a leader like a Sherpa. And I love that standing at the back and then you can see the whole picture. And, you know, when I was climbing up Kilimanjaro, it's fascinating that some of the, the best guides and the best leaders were the ones that were at the back because they wanted to make sure that they were sweeping everyone up but they could see almost the big picture of the weather see the morale of the people and all of those things and actually it's a it's a really powerful model i think using something like that how about yourself nikki what are your thoughts on that on leadership yeah you know surrounding yourself with a great team of of different individuals with different skills that you can pull on at different times and it's you know um i i think management is very different to leadership um, yeah some of the, the most amazing leaders that I've ever worked for, you know, are, have, have taught me some fabulous things about what to do and what not to do. Yeah. Or, I, or think, I mean, do you not think a team that, forward? Yeah, you, that management side of things. I think management is like keeping it going in a circle. Leadership is taking it to the next circle and then allowing it to grow as well. It's that whole, there's a very big difference, isn't there? Yeah. And as a, as a leader, you know, in an organisation, I've always found it's important to, to make sure that you draw upon those resources within the team and the strength within the team as well. You're not going to be the person, I'm certainly not the person that knows everything. Um, you know, I, I look to my team for that level of guidance and support. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, there's a lovely, lovely question that's come up from Tegan. Um, how did you balance being one of the lads or in the gang and also being a woman? And did I ever feel compromised with banter? All they I used to call you Big Bird, didn't they? <laughs> My full time, <laughs> Big Bird. Yeah, absolutely. I was hoping for Ice Maiden. I thought, yeah, that's a really good thing. <laughs> and uh, I had a really hilarious incident. So we, we only used to wear our, our funny name badges, like the Big Bird ones, in the bar of an evening on a Friday. And once I had it on, on the, in the bar, and I must have forgotten to take it off my flying suit for Monday morning. I had a dentist appointment and I walked into the dentist and you've got normally, you know, Mandy Wells was my name, on the name badge. And she walked in and she went, name. And I sort of looked at her and thought, why do you even ask that? You can read my name. And so I pointed and she went, no, we have no big birds booked in today. And I went, oh my God, I'm really sorry. How embarrassing. Um, and sort of took it off my name badge. Um, but yeah, I was big bird, um, six foot tall and Sesame Street, what can I say? Um, but did I balance being one of the lads? To begin with, no, I got the balance completely wrong. Um, I became really quite blokey. Um, you know, I looked down at one point, we were going on a detachment and we had to be in civilian clothing. And all the men in the Air Force, if they ever go away, would always wear chinos, a blazer and a blue striped or checked shirt of some degree. And uh, offered deck shoes and I looked down and I was wearing exactly that outfit and I thought yes 
I've morphed into becoming a guy, you know, and I thought it was a really interesting one. Um, my language became a bit more sweary than I normally would. Um, unfortunately, that's stuck with me since. Um, but actually, yeah, and I, I realised that I was not trying too hard, but I was certainly losing my femininity. And I think that's just the need that anyone has to fit in. You just do it. You know, we, we see it all the time that people try to fit into a different environment. And I was definitely in that in that camp. Um, but one thing I didn't like was when I did turn up to my very first squadron, they'd never had a woman um, pilot. I turned up and all the screensavers were of, of scantily clad women, sort of Pirelli's calendar feel to it. And um, I thought, yeah, I'm not really that keen on that. So I changed them all to scantily clad men. And the next day they were all landscapes. Someone had just come in and gone, oh, I'm not having that. And they changed the water. So you can read these little silent protests. I mean, I've never had a female toilet, um, just a small thing. But, you know, you, you're working from a hardened aircraft shelter on my squadrons. And there weren't male or female toilets. There was just a toilet. So basically I got a little sticker and I just went, Mandy's in, you know. And, and sometimes if I was too desperate, I just... I could see that you're right along going, just behind you, just so that you know. But you know what? It's just the way it is. And we were out in Ali Al Salem and I'm in a block, a barrack block. There's 40 bedrooms. Every time you could decorate these bedrooms out in um, uh, Kuwait. And I'd be given the one which was wall to wall pornography. It was almost like a standing joke. They just love to do this. I'd walk in, strip the pornography off the walls and the ceiling. I mean, mainly of the other rooms didn't have any but they always gave me the room with the porn. I'd stick it all outside my door and go, porn's up! And the guys would all come and grab it and it would just be gone within minutes. But I, I had a thick skin. And as I look back now, 20 years later, that behavior is not acceptable. Of course it's not. But at the same time, you have to put the caveat of what was going on. They hadn't had women. I'm not criticizing the Air Force. I'm not criticizing anyone was there. That was just what the way it was. I'm pleased it's changing. Of course I am. It's not acceptable now, but we all needed to evolve together. And it was just a process we went through. And, and I believe the Air Force did the best job that they could at the time, but the guys were getting used to it just as I was. And I don't think you can change that. Okay, there's another question come in. Do you have any advice on how to handle difficult people? in teams as a leader yeah so i think actually i can you can almost use sort of the feedback model that we have so we we do a lot of debriefing okay uh every single flight that you do you debrief um and you always run through a, a funnel what happened what are the facts why did it happen what's the cause but most importantly how can we be better and actually by having a debrief what it does is and having a model like that you take emotion out of it because it's almost like you're going, okay, just what were the facts? What was the timeline? Now, if you've got difficult people, but you almost put it into a non-emotional model, then actually you can say, let's look at the behaviors that people are exhibiting, not the personalities that somebody has. So you always try to remove it from the who. And that's one of the questions when you're doing the debriefing is you never focus on the who you always focus on all the other sorts of open questions, the what, why, where, when, but not the who, because you must depersonalize it. And actually by doing that, you get some really good results because you, you're in a learning environment. So if you have a very difficult person in your team, A, it's about concentrating on the behaviors that they're exhibiting and, and removing the personality, and then trying to get to the root cause of it. Because sometimes that, you know, actually there might be a conflict that's coming up because people aren't talking. And if you can create a culture whereby people do feel empowered to speak up, to challenge, then that is really important as well. And something luckily that we had, that we used, which was a really good feedback tool, was something called Boost. It was a really quick and easy sort of thing. You say, can I give you a boost? Now, that it's an acronym. We love our acronyms and it's a five letter acronym. You can't say better than that. But it's balanced, objective, observed specific and timely so you timely being i'm going to give it you now again what we're doing is we're taking the emotion out of it you know because you're just going to con concentrate on specific things that have happened recently not something that happened a while ago and by doing that it feels quite a positive way it's almost like a whirlwind brief debrief of almost like what can we do better um yeah so 
yeah, I mean, that's the way that I would normally do it, is just to try to remove the emotion from that and actually just sit down and have a really transparent conversation. Uh, and if it's really difficult, the use of mediator, you know, having someone that is not involved, that, you know, actually can sort of bring the two parties together. Do you have any advice, uh, yes, Nikki? Yes, well, I was thinking actually similar to the situation that, you know, you had when you had sort of bullying. Yeah. You felt, you know, as if you were being bullied. But when you actually got down to the crux of the situation, as I understand, it was more about the the challenges that individual was going through. And yeah, you know, yeah it was absolutely it out on you. Yeah, um, and just to give you a bit of an insight into that, so I was in Iraq for the first time. Uh, we were flying over the no fly zone, based out of Kuwait, and a senior flight lieutenant, so same rank as me, but very much a central character on the squadron decided to make my life really unpleasant. And he targeted me constantly. And at every briefing we were in, every question came to me, not the other three new pilots, just me. And he wore me down. And every time I would walk outside, the, the, you know, the group would become silent. I knew they were talking about me. And it, I, I just got quieter and quieter. I retreated completely inside myself. I just went and sat in my room. Fortunately, I had about 14 Jilly Cooper novels to read. So you know what? It was, it was, I coped with it, but I actually wrote a, it called Bluey. We couldn't, we couldn't sort of, you know, there weren't that much on the emails. We only allowed one 20 minute phone call a week. And I'm just desperate to speak to women. So I was going, I'd love to speak to you, my husband, Craig. However, I need to speak to women. Uh, I don't want to talk about politics or football any longer. I just want to talk about real life emotions. And so I sort of ended up splitting it with like three minute conversations with all my friends. But I actually said to Craig, I'm thinking of leaving. This guy has broken me down. And I, this is not what I was wanting. I, I, I've joined the Air Force. I've worked everything, every single bean of my being towards this point. I am hating it. And he said, get a grip. He said, do not let them beat you down. He said, Mandy, you're worth more than that. And I thought, okay, he's got a really good point. But it, I didn't say anything at the time. And it took us to come back to RF Marham be in a bar on a Friday evening, his wife was present, the buddy's wife was present, my Craig was with me, good solid wingman, and I went up to him, he said, go and, go and speak to him, and I was like, I don't want to say anything, and he said, Mandy, get in the grip again, go and challenge him, and I just said, you know, are you aware, just what, how you made my life, you made it a living hell out there, and his wife went, you did what, you know, whack, and, um, but the reality is, is that he said, I didn't know. Work. I didn't know. I didn't know. I think. And I said, "Oh, come on! You, you know, every question. You're always talking about me behind my back." I heard, and he said, uh, "And I said, think about it over the weekend, and then come back to." It. Anyway, he got me in on the Monday morning, and he just said, "Mandy, the first thing I have is that Mandy into my office." I thought, "Oh God, I'm in real trouble." And I walked in, and he just went, "I am so sorry. I have reflected on it all weekend." And he just said, "I just had to tell you." He said, "I, I, I am truly from the bottom of my heart." repentant on what's happened he said but just to give you some backstory I, I my wife gave birth to our second daughter literally moments before me going out to Kuwait and I was so angry that I had three months out in a war zone and I was not spending it with my family my wife was given was finding it really difficult with a 18 month old and a three you know day old and her husband wasn't there so I was getting it on all sides and I'm sorry I was the pressure cooker was exploding and you were my target and that's the all I can say. So and probably thought, challenging it at the time would may have made it worse. Made it worse, yeah. You, you don't know. Yeah, you don't know. It, it's always um, it's always difficult dealing with difficult people, but you know, just try, try and find out what what's underlying it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Natasha there always, always is. You well, typically is. Yeah, there there are normally is. It's, you know, if you can get to the root cause of it, there's no always a reason. Um, it could be insecurities with somebody as well, but you know, um, when we open up the lines to Natasha, yeah, that would be lovely. That one, and she I'm, doesn't mind. Yeah, and also, guys, you know, for this the last little period, if you're happy to stick your phones, stick your cameras on, I'd love to see those beautiful faces, <laughs> especially Dan, much more. Um, you know, please, it would be lovely to see you. So, if you wanted to turn your faces on and demute, that would be great to see you. Hello, Dan. Hi, Dan. Watch <laughs> out, you're all right. Yeah, good, thank you. You've Isn't got an additional good? member of the audience as well in Helen. Oh, yes. we've got the whole family. It's a family. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go back to you. So we've got Natasha. Does, Natasha, are you happy to ask your question? Silence. 
She's there. Natasha? Uh, I can see that you've demuted Natasha, but it's not coming through. So I'll tell you what, I'm just going to read out your question, if that's okay, unless you can try again. No, I think it's a problem there. Um, did you find any of the guys that you worked with confided in you where they, where they might not have been able to with their male colleagues? And if so, how did you handle that? I did. I found that all the time. And actually, do you know what? I think that that's yet another reason why mixed gender teams work so well, because you you bring a different dynamic to the team. And so often I'd be, someone would say, man, can we have a game of squash or can we play tennis? Or do you fancy going to the gym with me? And it's amazing what then comes out because, you know, the, the Air Force has ch was changing massively. It had gone away from this eat glass, fast jet mentality that has existed. And we were, we were morphing into very different people that were coming through. Um, I'd say sort of slightly more softer characters, less alpha male characters. Um, and I, it was great to see. And yeah, they did enjoy female conversation and, you know, I think it was a real positive. Um, yeah. How did I handle it? Well, actually I was, I felt honored. I felt really happy that they were great to, you know, that they were happy to share things with me. And, and also they wanted to just to test things through from hearing a female perspective. So you were their trusted colleague, um, which was great. But one of the really interesting things was as well, and I really found this one was the best top tip. And it was from another female, it was from a female navigator. And she said, get to know the wives. And I thought, that's a bit of a weird one. That's a bit of a patronizing sort of comment, get to know them. But actually I was about to go off for three months, for two months here and there, for exercises, uh, operations with their husbands. And if they didn't trust me, then they would be feeling really worried that I was gonna steal their husbands or that they've got this woman around. And also I felt it was really important for them all to see Craig and to get to know him because A, he's a bloody good looking chap, uh, looks excellent in a Navy uniform. And also, you know, it's really good, a great character. So actually that was really important to, for them to see, I'm with somebody who I truly want to be with. I'm not going away because I want to steal your husband. You know, and that became really important. You know, I got invited to the coffee mornings or to um, wine evenings or I offered to babysit. Wed weddings. And weddings. I became <laughs> godmother, you know, to many of the children. And actually that was fantastic, but it meant that I was trusted. And that was really, really important. So as we're closing, could you tell me a little bit, and there might be some more questions, but... For, for me, I want to hear about your favourite moment in an aircraft. Oh, yeah. So actually, it's bizarrely not flying fast jets. It was, um, it was flying with a young lady, actually, and her name was uh, Emily. And I fly when I left the Air Force. So someone asked if I fly now, actually. I finally hung up my flying boots at the moment. I'm not currently flying. But when I left the Air Force in 2011, I rejoined as a volunteer reservist. And for years, I flew cadets until just a year ago, flew cadets with the air training course, so 13 to 18 year olds, and it was lovely for me to pass back that love. And I was flying, I was flying cadets, 10th cadet of the day, I'm knackered, my bottom's numb. This girl walked out and I thought, I looked at her and I thought, oh my gosh, she's got this parachute on her shoulders were bent over, she had quite an angry look on her face, you know, and I thought, joy to the world, what a wonderful way to end the day. And I said, hi, my name's Flight Lieutenant Mandy Hickson. She was like, I'm Emily. I thought, lovely. So Emily got into this airplane and she's strapping in. She's got loads of eye makeup on. I'm thinking, oh, I wonder under G-force if that weight of mascara will prevent her from opening her eyes, you know. And um, we started to taxi out and I was trying to put her at ease, you know. Ever flown before? No, looking forward to exposed. I thought, oh, Christ. Anyway, we get airborne and it's a beautiful sunny day. Pilot's paradise, white fluffy clouds. We're flying everywhere. It's brilliant. Honestly, loved it. And um, I looked across and she sort of, Seems to be enjoying it, but not really showing me much. And at the end, basically, we were, I was challenging her. We did 30 degree turns. Most cadets are up and down by a few hundred feet. Not Emily. She rolls in. She nailed it. I said, let's see if you can do 60 degrees. Now, that's much more challenging. You have to add full power and pull back on the stick. Otherwise, your nose comes slicing through the horizon. You end up in this spiral descent, potentially to death. But, you know, I've never lost any yet. Anyway, so I said, um, I said do you want to try a 60 degree turn? She went, all right. I said, well, what you need to do? And she went, don't tell me. I read about that somewhere. I thought, oh my God, this is going to be fascinating. She's going to end up in this spiral descent. So I went, fine, you crack on then. 
I thought this will be interesting. So she rolls in, she adds the power, she pulls back, she did it perfectly. It was really, really annoying, is all I can say. Um, I know you're thinking, I'm saying, oh, it's fantastic, but I was really hacked off by that. I'm thinking, bloody hell, this girl's brilliant. And so then I said, let's do some aerobatics at the end. And I taught her, was teaching her how to do a loop. I said, I'm going to teach you how to do a loop. Okay, we're going to lower the nose, 140 knocks, accelerate, tense your legs and your tummy, otherwise the blood will pull in your feet. As you get down there, you're going to pull forward, you back on the stick. Uh, as you go up, you're looking for the horizon, keep your wings level. Uh, as you go through the horizon, you go, yee-haw, at the top of your voice, and then you do a 4G pull at the bottom. Anyway, I did mine. And when you come out, by the way, if you've done it perfectly, the whole aeroplane shakes violently. So anyway, it's because you go through your own slipstream, by the way. So anyway, I did mine, and mine was very smooth, but there was no shaking. I gave her control, control, you know, she pushes down, she pulls, I went, yee-haw! She didn't, I was a bit embarrassed at that point. She pulled out the bottom of hers, and it went, da, 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 da. And I looked across, and she has got this radiant smile on her face, and it said to me, I'm better than you. And I thought... <laughs> I'm gonna to have to break you now. Anyway, I threw everything at this girl, she's brilliant. We landed and we were taxiing in and I just said to her, I said, do you know what, Emily? I've been flying now for about 28 years. I said, I know I don't look old enough anyway. Um, and I said, in all that time, I have never flown with someone with so much natural talent as you. Do you know what she said? I bet you say that to everyone. It's like, I could have shaken her, but you know, you're not allowed to touch them. Anyway, I said, I've never said it to anyone. Is this something you might want to do? And she went, you're joking. And I went, no. And she went, oh, mum, it's all I've ever wanted to do the whole of my life. All I've ever dreamed about doing was becoming a pilot. And I honestly thought, what happens if I try really hard today and I'm rubbish at it? What am I going to do then? And so she said, I decided not to try, not to show you I was interested because if I did, then I'd not ever be able to blame it on the fact I didn't try. I was like, oh my God, Emily, you cannot live your life like that. I said, how many opportunities are going to go whipping by unless you grab them? I said, how are you doing at school? She went, that hate it. I went, that enables this, so you better be good at it. Anyway, I saw her a year later and she walked past me in this crew room and I just spotted all the eye makeup. I thought, oh my God, it's her. And she said, I bet you don't remember me. I thought, I better do. Because I now used her in my speech as an example. And um, I said, as it happens, I do remember you, Emily. How are you doing? She went, well, I got all my exams and I'm now doing my A-levels and I still want to be a pilot. And I said, well, you're the best one I've ever met. And it was a real light bulb moment for me because I've been thinking about going into the airlines. I got my airline tra transport pilot's license, my commercial pilot's license by then. I was all set for going into the likes of EasyJet, following what my husband was doing. And I thought, I don't want to do that. I've never wanted to do it. And I'd just been going on this gravy train. And it was in that moment I thought, actually, if you can inspire the next generation just to look outside the box of the norm, then that is a monumental moment. And it's so easy to empower others. And it goes back to what you're doing, Nikki, in this mentorship program. You know, actually challenging people to be better than themselves, passing on a love of a career that you have achieved, and actually trying to share that around. That's the most important gift that you can ever give to anybody. And it's made a monumental difference in my life. And at that point, I decided to go to schools and really start to pass that message on. If I can get one child to change their route, not to become a pilot, but think outside the box, then I was succeeding. And that made it really, really important to me. Um, I hope Carrie's daughter is listening to this. Hello, Carrie's daughter. <laughs> Hello. 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 I think that looks like a really inspiring fast jet pilot in the making. Yeah, why not? Would you like to fly a plane? Wouldn't like that. That. <laughs> One like that? Would you like to fly that? Yeah, she would. Yes. <laughs> Good girl. Fabulous. <laughs> Great stuff. Well, that's obviously what we aim to do with the, you know, the mentorship program and all of the mentors have all said throughout the program. Um, we've been doing this now for, for over three years. Um, and they've all said exactly the same. If only we had that same mentorship during our early careers. So yeah. they equally get as much out of it as the mentees. Yeah, I, I genuinely think you do. And, and you know, when you say the, the, the act of giving is so much more rewarding, it's so true, isn't it? Yeah. You know, when you start to give, you think, I am actually getting so much more back myself. I mean, just doing like the, the stuff in the laundry, people said, oh, that's so good for you. I was like, yeah, there's a, double, there's a double line to that. We're doing it because actually I want to feel like I'm giving something as well. So let's be honest about that. It hits both sides, doesn't it? But um, yeah. So I could chat with you all day, all week, all year. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people could on the call as well. 
It's been fantastic. Thank you so much, Mandy. Thank you, Nikki. The RISE organisation. You know, we really appreciate it. And we'd love to have you at an uh, event where we can all get together and uh, actually you can inspire us all. Uh, oh, thank you. Well, that's great. Well, and if anybody, just to give a quick plug to my book, only because it's only just come out, but if anyone is interested, an officer, not a gentleman, available on Amazon. Oh, uh, no! Come I, on, I have great. actually finished, if anybody would like to borrow Woo! it. <laughs> that's it. loved every minute of it. Yeah, fantastic. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank oh, you. That was amazing. Thank you. So thank you for attending the RISE session today. Um, Carrie, when's the next one? So we're having a little uh, hiatus break for the, next, for the next few weeks over the summer and our next one's at the beginning of September. So yeah, look out for details in our newsletter and on Twitter. We'll be announcing it soon. Thanks, Nikki and Mandy. That was amazing. Thanks, thank guys. Thank you. Lovely to talk to you again, Mandy. Lovely to talk to you, Nikki. Take care. Thanks, Bye. guys. Bye. Bye. You can unmute now, Dan. <laughs> what? <laughs> Just a minute, I'm stopping recording. <laughs>